Welcome to part three, the penultimate episode of a four part series where I assemble a compact hi-fi system from components that I bought from eBay on a limited budget. So far I managed to keep the budget down by getting three things in one, the amplifier, the cassette player and the radio in this Casiva and also I bought some speakers that were on a good discount so all in I've spent about £145 on the setup you see here and to this today I'm going to be adding on the record player. Now thankfully it was well packaged again, very important to package a turntable properly if you're going to get it to the other end in one piece, especially if it's got a Perspex lid on it like this. Now in the first video I mentioned that my preference is towards a direct drive, fully automatic quartz lock turntable. I wasn't able to get all those features on the day I was looking for the price I was prepared to pay. So what I've got here is a semi-automatic direct drive turntable that doesn't have quartz lock. The model is a Pioneer PL200X. The X in that stands for the fact it's the black edition. There's a PL200 which is the silver version. Dates were around 1980 and in the Pioneer range at that point there were a number of similar looking turntables. I think this might explain the reason that I prefer a direct drive version. In the catalogue at the time the base one was the PL100 which didn't have direct drive that was a belt drive turntable. If you went up to the PL200 then that was direct drive so in the Pioneer hierarchy direct drive comes above belt drive which is perhaps why I think it's better and then if we went to the PL300 well that includes a quartz lock so I've gone in the middle for the PL200X. Now whenever I pick up a new turntable I'll look at a website like Vinyl Engine to see if I can find out more details about it. You'll see some reviews on there perhaps you might be able to find out what kind of cartridge and stylus it uses and also often you'll be able to download the instructions which is very important when setting one of these up. Now of course as this turntable is made for the UK I'm going to have no problems however if I decided to import an older turntable say from the 1960s from the US there's a good possibility that it would only want to run on a 60 hertz power supply so if I tried to run that in the UK it would play back slowly. Now as far as the outputs go on this we've got the RCA left and right and a ground lead on there. I suppose there's some turntables that might come without the ground lead, more than likely those wouldn't need to go into a phono preamp, they'd already have one built in. But as this does have the appropriate lead you'll want to attach it up to that connector on the left and that will cut out any hum. A built-in phono preamp is one of the benefits of these older amplifiers. They tended to take them off later on and you'd need to use a separate phono preamp like I've got here for my modern amplifier. The problem with this is it's one more thing to switch on and one more thing to plug in. So much better to have one built into the main amplifier. Now you might recall from the first video that I was buying everything together as quickly as possible so I didn't use any auctions that were going to take a while to run. On this one I used Buy It Now which meant that it cost me £58 including delivery. The information on that eBay auction was pretty light on detail. The only thing I can see here it said there was some light scratching on the lid and it is very light. It's very hard to see unless you get it under certain lighting conditions so not a problem at all. It's actually quite good to get a fully intact lid on a turntable of this age. Often they've been cracked, snapped off of the hinges or are just missing entirely. And the seller was careful enough with this one to tie down the tone arm for transportation, which was a sensible idea. But that tone arm also has a retention clip, which I was happy to see is also in one piece. So often these have been snapped off as well. And unlike those cheap and nasty turntables in a suitcase that you might buy from certain clothing stores, this one has the appropriate controls to accurately adjust the downward tracking force, that's the weight that's placed on the stylus, as well as keep that stylus towards the centre of the groove by adjusting the anti-skate mechanism. We'll start off by adjusting the tracking force, I'll show you how you do that. So first thing, this is obviously wrong, that's not even going anywhere near a record, so we need to get that to a certain sort of level, an equal equilibrium, get the weight so that the arm is perfectly balanced in the centre. And to do that you twist both weights at the back, there's a silver one and a black one there, you get them both twisted to a certain point and eventually you'll get it so that the arm just hovers flat. And then once you've got it to that point make sure you've twisted that back bit round so that zero is at dead centre top middle and then you adjust the weight slightly by moving the forward weight of the two on its own and that will then indicate the downward tracking force. Now I wanted to find out what the tracking force recommendation is for this particular cartridge. 
I was looking for a model number or something, was unable to find anything. So I've guessed at it requiring about two and a half grams of trekking force. So let's just see, that's supposed to be about two there, but that doesn't look right to me at all. So to make sure I'm doing this right, I've broken out my stylus scales again. Now these things are very useful and don't cost very much at all. So if you want to make sure your tracking force is accurate, get yourself a stylus scale. So now I can put the stylus on the end of this and adjust the counterbalance weight until it reads two and a half grams. Now I've picked that number out of thin air, but it's based on my previous experience of similar record players requiring a tracking force of around about that amount. So I think I won't be too far out. Now the next thing to do is adjust the anti-skating dial accurately and to do this you'll also need to have a disc that doesn't have a groove on it, a shiny disc. Now sometimes you'll get a record that one side hasn't been printed on, that's ideal for this, or maybe perhaps use a laser disc, but in my case I'm going to be using this test disc which has an appropriate section on side B. There's information on the back of the sleeve that explains why you want to adjust the anti-skating, but basically you want the stylus to ride as much near the centre of the groove as possible. The record player itself wants to push the stylus, of course, towards the centre, but if it was just allowed to do this, it would push against the left-hand side of the groove, which would emphasise that part of the stereo track. So really, you want the stylus to ride in the centre as much as possible. So by adjusting the dial, you're pushing back against that force that's trying to push the arm in towards the middle. Now, by doing it on a shiny surface like this, you can see which way the arm wants to move. As you can see there, it just goes straight towards the centre. So I just dial it back the other way, and then, of course, it wants to move towards the outside. So careful adjustment adjustment eventually gets it so that the stylus is quite happy just riding in the centre. Now whilst this turntable doesn't have a quartz lock it does have a speed control and a strobe which means I can adjust the speed so that the strobe looks like it's appearing to stand still. Quite difficult to see on camera and not that much easier in person but at least I can see that the speed on this turntable is staying relatively accurate. So with all the settings done, just a matter of connecting it up to the appropriate input on the back of the Casiva, and I do think it looks a little bit too large. The colour scheme's fine, but it does seem to dwarf the other components. It would have been better if I could have got something that fitted on top of here, and indeed there was an appropriate turntable, the Technics SL5 that was designed for this model, linear tracking, fully automatic. So if I could have found one of those, that would have been ideal. But this is the one I could find on the day I was looking. This is the one we've got, we've got it all set up, so let's have a listen to it now. The record I'll be using has been provided to me by the group and they got in touch and said did I want a record to be able to use in the videos because it won't hit content marks. I said well only if it's got acoustic type stuff on it because I've got loads of synth type music from people like Anders Enger Jensen but sometimes that isn't really appropriate for testing analog playback because with all the pitch bend sounds and things you can't be too sure if you've got speed irregularities. I really wanted something that everyone knows what it should sound like like a guitar for example. Well it just so happens that that's the kind of music that these chaps put together so I accepted their kind offer and let's have a listen. So everything, I'm happy to say, is working perfectly. The audio is really good as well. You won't get that feeling coming across on this video. It will sound a little bit thin, and that's purely because it's being recorded on my camera's built-in microphones. It's a lot richer and fuller in person, and what I'll do in part four, I'll give a direct feed from a record so you get a bit more of an idea as to that original quality. But the turntable's mechanisms are working well. Of course, a semi-automatic mechanism means you put the arm on yourself manually at the beginning, but when the arm reaches the end of a record it will automatically return back to the rest position and everything will switch off. The amplifier's built-in preamp is working great, no issues there at all, no buzz or hum on that, so very happy with that. 
The only thing that I think is a little bit unusual or odd about this record player is the fact that there's no on-off button on it. Well, it's unusual to me. It's all my other record players have a on-off switch. The buttons you see on this, well, the bottom right is labelled cut. When you press that, it lifts the arm off the record, it moves back to the rest position and the device shuts down. The bottom left button, that's the speed between 33 and 45, and next to that is the fine speed adjustment wheel. So yes, to start this device up or turn it on, all you do is lift the arm up above the platter and it will then automatically start spinning. But yeah, there's no separate power switch. Okay, so that's it for part three. We've got the record player set up. Everything seems to be functioning perfectly. I've got to thank these chaps who sent over their album for me to demonstrate this with. Your lad with Show Me The Sign. I'll put a link to these guys in the video description text box. They promised me that this wouldn't hit any YouTube auto content matches, so I hope that's right. I do have a couple of little reservations about this particular turntable I chose, though. But I think what I'll do in part four, the final part where I add on the the compact disc player to complete the whole setup I'll do a bit of a summary as to the things that I perhaps would have done differently if I was doing this again but that's all for part four which should be along in a day or so but that's it for part three as always thanks for watching